So we heard Dr. Eustace, and uh, I gotta say, she gave possibly one of her best talks I have listened to, and I've listened to quite a few of her talks. So thank you very much, Dr. Eustace, for doing that. A lot of exciting data, so much to talk about. Actually, so much that I, in the, my role as a moderator, I have a hard time picking up what is really the first thing to start talking about. But um, before we even do that, why don't we just take a tour and introduce uh, ourselves as you know, members of this, of this panel. Uh, Jennifer, Miss um, Harmon. <laughs> um, I'm Jennifer Harmon. I'm an assistant director with the Orange County Crime Lab. I've been a forensic toxicologist for nearly 18 years. Um, and we have a, a pretty unique perspective in Orange County. We're the only laboratory in a county of 3.2 million people. Um, that does both anamortem and postmortem drug testing and alcohol testing. So we get to see the drugs that people are in possession of, what they're trafficking, what they're driving under the influence of, what's used in drug facilitated crimes, and also what they're overdosing or potentially dying from. So we have some pretty meaningful data. We've been tracking cannabis data for quite some time, uh, both pre and post legalization. We also track our uh, fatal drug prevalence numbers as well, which I'd be happy to share later if you'd like. Thank you so much, Dr. Fitzgerald. Uh, Rob Fitzgerald, I started my career as a forensic toxicologist, kind of like Jennifer, and, and I moved on to uh, uh, become a clinical chemist and analytical toxicologist. I'm a professor at UCSD. Uh, we are primarily interested in the effects of cannabis and both medical uh, utility as well as effects on driving, both from people that take it medicinally and, and recreationally. Um, our current study is was funded by AB 266, and it's uh, 1,800, <clears throat> it's 180 people with a placebo-controlled trial that we are finishing up. We actually have recruited 186 people, so in the next week we're going to actually start to unblind that and start to see how the the, uh, the driving performance correlates with both analytical findings, which is my main responsibility, and uh, officers' observations. Uh, we've been fortunate to have a great collaboration with the CHP, and the CHP, and as part of the study, they're blinded. It's the first time that they've ever participated, as far as I know, in a blinded controlled trial um, looking at the effects of marijuana on driving. Um, so we're excited about that. We've got a bunch of other projects coming forward. We're, uh, also in collaboration with CHP and the DMV, where we're actually going to be, instead of putting people in simulators, we'll actually have them driving, and we'll be combining uh, THC as well as alcohol and looking at those experiments. Thank you. Marilyn, I think I'm going to skip you because you already have been introduced. What about you, Brent? Dr. Uh, Young? My name is Brent Young. I'm an assistant clinical professor here in the Department of Anesthesiology and Perioperative Medicine, also in the Division of Pain Medicine. Uh, I'm specifically working on projects looking at THC's effect on the brain and in relation to that, looking specifically at eye reactivity and measurements to assess what those changes are and if they can be specifically used to identify impairment under the influence of cannabis. Thank you very much. So just for everybody to know, we uh, will be taking questions. Uh, so start thinking about questions for uh, the panelists and for Dr. Hustis in particular, because we didn't have a QA for her lecture. But uh, while you uh, gather your thoughts, I thought the one first thing that we could be um, discussing is the difference between uh, medicinal cannabis and adult non-medicinal use of cannabis. The, um, and how, in the context of uh, driving, uh, how we can put that in the context of driving so that we do minimal harm and uh, to either the users, the medical users, or um, uh, drivers and, and, and other folks. Um, so just as a, as a background, uh, one thing that we do know about the medicinal use of cannabis is that the, usually the doses that are needed to produce effects that are uh, desirable effects in terms of uh, pain control, for example, nausea control, um, appetite stimulation, those are um, obtained at doses of cannabis that are THC in particular that are lower than those that are sought after by individuals who instead are seeking a high, are seeking so they, 
uh, no medical uh, use of, of cannabis. So it, with that as a background, I'd like to ask all of you, uh, how do you actually see this? Is it possible to take those two apart such that so that an individual who is using cannabis for real medicinal purposes is not penalized for having done so? Uh, Ms. Auerman, would you like to start? Well, I think, you know, from, from our perspective forensically, we can't tell the difference between somebody who's using something as a medicine versus somebody who's using it recreationally. Um, in our experience with working with law enforcement, um, it's, we're looking at impairment, whether that impairment is, and whether that person is really a safe um, operator of a motor vehicle. And so um, there are plenty of medicines that people take as well that they are legally prescribed that can make them unsafe to operate a motor vehicle as well. So it, from a forensic perspective, we can't necessarily tell the difference um, unless, of course, we're dealing with some of the medicines where we know what therapeutic levels are. And again, um, you know, having that information on cannabis is certainly helpful. Um, but it would be very difficult for us to tell from our toxicological testing what is critical would be the impairment piece and the um, information that's gleaned from law enforcement as to what's really going on in the situation at the time. Um, because again, our goal is to ensure public safety and that we have the ability to comprehensively test people and determine are these drugs something that is contributing to a public safety risk like a bear drug. So you're basically saying impairment is impairment is impairment. Right. It doesn't really matter at the end of the day what drug causes it as long as we are able to uh, detect it. But from a, um, and I'm going on a limb here because this is really not my specialty, but from a, a legal perspective, uh, if one were to be found to be impaired and also to have, say, detectable levels of THC in her or his blood, uh, that could have legal consequences that are different from not having any, any THC. And that's where I think the medical versus non-medical use come potentially into play, because here is a case uh, in point. You could have a, a person who is impaired, who is using medicinal cannabis for a, 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 an acceptable purpose, but at the same time is impaired for another reason, and that person gets into legal trouble, if I could use this expression, because has levels of THC that are detectable. That is where I think it's important to hear from the experts to see if there is anything that we can do to remove or reduce that risk. Any, anybody else would like to uh, comment on this? So, so I think Jennifer's point was is that it doesn't really matter what drug it is, and you know, people can still get in trouble for taking Xanax. And you know, if they're driving under the influence of Xanax, that's also... One of the things that I didn't fully really appreciate until recently was is that medical cannabis use, as you alluded to, is much lower. You know, they're talking doses of, you know, several milligrams to five milligrams versus 30 milligrams or 50 milligrams for a record. So the concentrations are, are clearly different. And from a medical perspective, they're using it at non-psychoactive. It has a benefit for reducing the number of pain meds, but it doesn't get them high. So I think uh, you touched on the elephant in the room. Uh, all of the laws that we've had do not deal at all with people who are using medical cannabis. It's just sort of ignored. Um, there isn't, as, as everybody has said there, you know, when you measure the THC, it's THC. There's nothing different. If they were truly on Marinol, for instance, that's just pure THC, you wouldn't see other uh, cannabinoid analytes, but nobody's going to do that. And uh, Marinol is, has been available for a long time. And it's, you know, people, there's a lot of people like, for instance, AIDS patients that felt very strongly that the smoke route helped them a lot more than the oral route. Um, again, we don't have all the data and whatever, but mm -hmm. I think it's amazing that countries and states make big changes like Canada, uh, for example, or, or California here, and, and nobody's addressing that issue. I mean, and it's a real issue. If, if the whole purpose that we're doing this to get 
benefit from different cannabinoids, we have to deal with that issue. And I agree with both Jennifer and Rob that um, impairment is impairment. If somebody can take their medication and not be impaired, that's why I believe the first thing we should do is establish that the person's impaired, and then a biological sample for what it is, rather than a per se, where exactly somebody who would, would be, could be positive based on the, the limit. So, I, and I do think people can um, be impaired by medicinal cannabis. I mean, I've seen that in uh, different countries I've visited and things. So, you know, you, driving is a privilege, not a right. And it's certainly important for every person to have the best medicine that works. So I believe that. But this is what I'm saying, society has to deal with this. Where, where are you going to draw the line that people can take the drug and be a danger to themselves and others on the road or not? And, the, and nobody's dealing with that issue. So I think it, it needs to be out there. We need to discuss it. We need to determine what are the therapeutic ranges. We don't have that at all. We don't know what the therapeutic ranges are for anything. I mean, Marinol, uh, that's available from 2.5 milligrams up to 20, I believe. Nobody has been doing testing to see what are the concentrations people are taking. Yeah. We did 20 milligrams around the clock like a medicinal person would do. We could certainly look at that. But it, it's, it's a huge issue. And if we're really going to get benefit from cannabinoids like we hope we are, we have to deal with how are we going to deal with these other issues. Like... Um, you know, I'm really concerned about people smoking in the home, uh, using it with young kids around. I mean, they're going to be breathing it. They're going to be getting it off the floor and everything else. So I, there's a lot of issues that need, and this is a huge one. Second hand, of course, is another very impo important issue. I don't want to beat this horse too much, but what I, I was really heading to is not so much whether somebody is impaired because he or she is on medical cannabis, but whether somebody who is not impaired because of the medical cannabis, but for some other purpose, yeah. then gets in trouble because he's also right. found, or she's also found out, to have THC levels. Right. So that's, that is where I think what Dr. Houston's pointed out is really important, understanding how the levels at which it's acceptable to have THC. And ultimately, the problem is there is no such level, what matters is not so much how much THC you have in your system, but how much your cannabinoid receptors, which are the ultimate responsible for the effects of THC, are activated. So along those lines, uh, Dr. Jung, uh, do you think uh, you have something to offer? Yeah, so I think the presentation today highlighted that the blood levels are, are not really a great measurement of determining whether somebody is impaired under the influence of cannabis and specifically the amount of time that it takes to get those blood levels when they get from the point of when they get arrested or pulled over to when they go to the, uh, the police station and get their blood drawn. So I think that we need to develop a, a way for a bioassay that is readily available and can be used right out in the field that, pro that produces some objective data uh, that shows that they're being at that real time being uh, affected by the effects of THC or cannabinoids. Um, and just taking a step back and looking at how we assess uh, brain function, uh, there are several ways that we talked about that we can assess brain function. One of them is like functional MRI, EEG, but may not be readily available out in the field. Another way that we, we know and have assessed brain function, in, at least in the hospital, is by looking at pupillary response, pupillary reflexes, um, to determine the activity of the brain. And I believe that we can use that at the eye as a window into how the brain is functioning and what the effect of THC is on the brain. Uh, this is a good point where I think uh, we could stop for a minute and ask the audience to, if they have any questions for our panelists and for our uh, distinguished speaker, there is a question at the, at the back. So, so we all know that there are, and it's been proven by uh, studies, et cetera, that, that there are medicinal and medical benefits to marijuana use for certain people, or 
I'm just going to say that. With Marinol, <clears throat> if somebody is using Marinol, will there be any indication that they are having any psychoactive effects of it, or will that affect their ability to drive with Marinol? We are under the impression there is not. So, so we've done studies and published studies on concentrations uh, that you can get with multiple doses. Um, we evaluated certain things, but what I, what I think is important is ours were in volunteers. They're not medical patients. What we really need to see is in medical patients, we need to prove that it's efficacious. That's absolutely key, and that's my big job now is that Thomas Jefferson is working with physicians who have great ideas, who know diseases, they treat people well, and they're interested to see if cannabinoids will work. But they don't know how to design studies. You hear way too much of, oh, you know, this person couldn't walk and I gave them the drug and they walked. I mean, that doesn't help us at all to understand whether a drug's effect. So I think we need to do that first. And then second of all, what is the therapeutic range that is effective for them, and are they at that range? Do they have psychomotor and cognitive deficit? We don't know that, which is really a, a problem. My, my, my thoughts are is that for sure people that take, you know, sufficient Marinol are going to get psychoactive effects. Absolutely. Yes, yes. depends on the dose. So it's the same compound, and it doesn't matter if it came from Marinol or uh, pot brownie. Thank you. Yeah, there have been studies that show that Marinol at certain doses can cause psychotropic effects, and uh, we can just translate that into having effects on their driving as well. I can tell you, too, that 20 milligrams was well tolerated by the individuals. 30 milligrams was a lot of adverse events, a lot of lightheaded, faintness, whatever. So. You know, a big issue is what dose and how the frequency of the dose. Uh, Dr. Young, I'm interested to hear more about um, some of the uh, ocular testing that you're done, that you're doing. Um, you know, my concern with cognitive testing is without baselines, they are, you know, less useful. We won't have baselines, you know, in this driving situation. Um, uh, my company works on an eye-tracking device primarily using smooth pursuit measurements, so I'm wondering if you've looked at that or other ocular motor uh, tests. Um, so we haven't looked at smooth pursuit uh, ocular tests, but we have been looking at uh, pupillary oscillations that range in a normal frequency. Uh, there have been studies that are looking at uh, these pupillary oscillations after taking opioids in the hospital, and we see a characteristic change in that, those pupillary oscillations. Uh, we've done some preliminary studies, just observational studies on cannabis that show that it also changes pupillary oscillations, but distinctly differently from uh, opioids. So we're in the process of developing studies that are specifically looking at those changes. There is a, there are two questions, one. I have a question. Is it, is it, <clears throat> to my understanding that CBD acts in an inverse ratio to THC, Delta 9 THC, is that correct or not correct? I couldn't hear the question. Sure, CBD, yes. its proportion in a, um, in a compound is inverse to Delta 9 THC, or so is? It's all based on the horticulture, the seeds it comes from. So. In general, are you are you asking? Sorry, are you asking about physiological effects, or are you asking about what is actually like? If produced? you were to detect it in a blood sample, like when you see, if you were to detect it, one going up, one going down, or they they go parallel, like how it. Yeah, so it yeah, so it's all based on how it's grown. So the typical THC that was available for let's say five years ago, the goal was to have as much THC, and they didn't care about the CBD. There's a lot of that type of plant out there. Now there's a lot more interest in CBD. And um, there are plants that are actually bred. I was talking with Mahmoud Al Soli. He's got plants that have very high CBD with very low THC. And the studies, it's very important what that cannabinoid profile looks like. Not just CBD and THC, but cannabigerol, cannabinol, and others. So, um, 
you're going to see a lot more research where maybe the CBD is the, the prominent compound and very low THC. But I'll give you an example. We um, In Italy, they require their cigarettes to be less than 0.2% THC. In the U.S., we had the Farm Act, and we ha can have hemp, but it must have less than 0.03% THC. But I collaborated with the Italians, and if you smoke enough of the 0.02, you can, you can get effects, and you will be positive in your blood and urine for the drug. Just one second. Uh, wait for the mic, if you don't mind. Also, please uh, speak into the mic. Right. Uh, right here, this gentleman here. Thank you, doctor, for your nice presentation. I was wondering, was there any uh, effects of the person's age in your studies that has got impact on the uh, cognitive ability or the executive functions that you describe? Uh, in other words, uh, I would think that a young adolescent brain which is developing is different than a mature brain that is already developed. For example, if you take persons of age 30 or above, uh, was the impact same or could you comment on that? Well, I, are you talking about the brain imaging study? Yes. Yeah. So what was really interesting, we looked at that because we didn't know if, because we know that cannabinoid receptors can go down with age. Uh, but we looked at that study specifically at that, and there was no correlation with age. It, uh, the deficit was correlated with the years of cannabis use, not a frequent measure like how many you smoked yesterday or in a month. It was years of cannabis use that was the major factor. One more question to the back. Um, I wanted to hear a little more about the oral testing you did, because I think as far as impairment testing goes, there's always going to be a risk of if you've been pulled over and you are technically impaired, but there's no like physiological, biological tests that you've done, um, you could have just been like sleepy, and if you have THC in you, that'll show up. But I guess I just want to know, like, as far as biologically, I know that blood doesn't work, urine doesn't work, but what, what could you explain a little bit more about the oral testing you said? Well, I'm, I'm first going to say I, I would disagree with you that blood testing doesn't work. I, I think it's a, it's a very effective mechanism to determine um, active drugs that are affecting parts of the body, including the brain, uh, because it's what's actually circulating in the person um, at the time of the incident. So I, I think what's more important to point out is, with, is the effectiveness of collecting a blood sample and how quickly we can do that and understanding the challenges that we face by collecting that sample forensically. Um, and when we, we have you know, legal challenges and things like that about being able to get that sample. So um, I'll let these two individuals talk more about the oral fluid testing. We, we have done some piloting ourselves in Orange County. But what I can tell you is that we very effectively do get um, blood samples in the county, and we frequently, very frequently, find active drugs in, in those blood samples. So I think really, and, I, and I'm sure that Dr. Husses will back me up on this, that it's not that the blood sample is a poor sample. It's a very effective sample for impairment testing. Um, it's just the collection window, which is a little problematic for cannabinoids and can be problematic for a few other drugs as well um, that have different distribution profiles. So I'll, I'll let them speak to the oral fluid. So, so we are in the final stages of this study where we've collected oral fluid in placebo and 6% and 14% of marijuana. And oral fluid does look like it's going to have some value. That, that data is coming out next week. So. so we've published a lot on oral fluid. We've been doing oral fluid testing since, I think, 1988. Um, our country is really slow. Uh, they've been doing um, oral fluid testing in Australia. They take no blood. And I, first of all, I want to agree with Jennifer that getting the blood sample is very reflective of what's going on in the brain. The problem is getting it quickly. That's the huge problem. 
so if the oral fluid testing is we've tested the roadside ones we've tested the you know collect the oral fluid and get it evaluated in a laboratory where they can look for 70 or 80 drugs um, what there's a it works really well but it does not reflect what is in blood perfectly at all because when you smoke inhale or eat a drug you coat your whole oral mucosa in your mouth right and so after so it's it's good because it detects drugs well all right but it doesn't you can't predict what the blood concentration is going to be after three hours two to three hours it parallels beautifully what's in blood but you don't know when the person used it so you don't know where you are on that curve but so it's it's so effective it's non-invasive right so you don't have to have somebody draw the blood easily officers or anyone can be trained to collect it appropriately that's why it the um, people would like it better because you know they don't have to go and get their blood drawn so it's very sensitive and it's it's very good there's some dr drug groups like benzodiazepines it uh, benzodiazepines don't get into oral fluid as well they get in there but not as well as other drugs so it's a great way to see what's in there what in Australia, since 2003, for 15 years, they do all their drugs and driving by oral fluid. In Europe, most of the country are doing oral fluid. Canada just approved oral fluid and a couple of devices. The problem is, overall, since 2008, there have been 850 new drugs introduced through clandestine markets as novel psychoactive substances. A whole bunch of them are synthetic cannabinoids, a whole bunch that, and these, these synthetic drugs are meant to mimic. So you can't just do on the roadside a little oral swab and it'll tell you cocaine, it'll tell you can cannabinoids, it'll tell you opiates, what's the other one, amphetamine. It'll, so yeah, well benzos don't work for it. Okay, so it'll tell you that, but we've got a giant amount of drugs that could cause impairment. So my point is, document the impairment first, and this may help with the medicinal, because if the person is not high, you know, you first see, are they impaired? And then you take the biological sample to say, okay, this drug is there, that drug is there. So I think that's the way we're gonna go. And as far as markers, um, the National Institute on Drug Abuse and NHTSA, the Highway Safety, everybody's looking for a better measure of impairment. Um, so an objective one. And I know the DRE program really well, and they do it very well, and it's a good program. And we actually published a paper showing that it can document marijuana impairment and what parts of the DRE exam are best for identifying because people always say, oh, it was developed for alcohol. That's true, but it, it measures a lot of, so many people are trying to come up with a better way um, that is objective that you can put the right. I think one of the questions though that I have is how do you differentiate those people that have, are, were chronic smokers, they stopped for say, and they still have what, they still have active pH in their blood. How do you they differentiate still, that from the people that have just smoked? Right, but they still had psychomotor impairment, too. That's true, too. But it, how do you know that's from the cannabis, or is it from one of these synthetic cannabis, or a different? Uh, uh, because they were on a closed research, you <laughs> had no access to drugs. So I, there's a lot of cons I hear a lot of consensus around this table, and that makes me a little nervous. I like to throw a wrench into it, uh, just because part of science is actually to try to uh, sort of always, you know, dig deeper. So here is a situation where uh, I like to hear uh, the panelists comment on, um, and it's a hypothetical situation, but it's not, a, it's not an impossible situation. We know that the place where THC goes first is fat, white fat. It, it, it goes, in, at least in animals, it goes first to fat and then it goes to the brain. So we also know that fat is a very dynamic issue, right? So if uh, 
uh, it's cold out there, for example, or if you're under stressful situation, you activate your your sympathetic system, or you're on a diet, and that now you have this phenomenon called lipolysis, where fat is is actually activated and uh, fatty acids are released, along with fatty acids, anything that is in the fat, including THC. So here is a possible scenario. An individual who is with a BMI above 30, for example, so a substantial amount of, uh, of fat, and uh, a, a user, but a very sporadic user who has used during the weekend, let's say on a Friday night, and then is driving uh, or gets pulled over on, on Wednesday, and he just started a diet, right? So it, this, that individual, it seems like a very peculiar case, but I want to bring it up because it could, it, it, because of the way actually THC is different from alcohol, which Dr. Eustace has so well described, that individual will likely have detectable, quite detectable levels of THC, and yet that THC probably will not have any effect on his ability or her ability to drive a car. It may be pulled away for some other reason, and again, found out to be, uh, to contain, to have THC in his blood, that could have legal consequences. This is where I think we have to be a little bit careful when we s stand by the blood levels as being adamantly always a window into what the brain is, is actually seeing. So any comments on this? It's a very special case, I admit. But again, there are many case, special cases with cannabis. I, I think in our experience in, in dealing with the criminal justice system and in forensics, we look at the totality of what the circumstances are. There's a reason why that person was pulled over. Was it a reason for impairment or was it some other reason? What, what and how did that person perform on the different divided attention tasks that they were being given? Um, you know, what did their eyes look like? What were their physiological symptoms? Uh, how did that person perform on um, motor coordination tests and tasks and uh, tasks that require them to, you know, recall what they're supposed to be doing and be able to act and respond to instructions that are provided to them? So to, you know, I'll be the first one to tell you that a, lim that a number in and of itself does not tell you that somebody is impaired. It's the totality of what is happening with that individual at the time. So if this individual was pulled over for tinted windows, had no signs and symptoms of impairment, and I don't know why they would have been arrested in the first place, they shouldn't have been. So, I mean, I, I, those cases don't go to trial. And I think the prosecutors in the room and probably the defense attorneys in the room would tell you that. Those cases are not going to go to trial. There has to be good cause for someone to be arrested, to be suspected of being impaired for the purposes of driving, for us to ever even get a sample. Thank you so much. That was very, very clear. Any other comments on this point? Yeah, but I want to go ahead. No, I would say that's exactly the same thing. The police officers, are, their role is to take people that are impaired off the highway. They don't really care why. And they're observing things that is consistent with impairment, and then we find 10 nanograms of THC, we put that together, and that makes sense. Well, here's an, another scenario. Is it, say that person had somebody in their car that was smoking cannabis. They left, they dropped them off, and we know that cannabis can linger, at least the smell, and they get pulled over for tinted windows, they smell cannabis. They may have taken cannabis two weeks ago, and they have some cannabis in their blood. So I can hardly <laughs> wait for this question. I, I received a call of this kind of situation a week while I was at night, a call a week from a physician in Iowa, from wherever they are, saying, we had this person, um, they were a heavy chronic user, I should say heavy, chronic frequent user, um, they have turned their life around, They've, they're losing weight, they're going to the gym, they swear they didn't use the drug. And it's happened enough that I feel there's something there, okay, because you just get too many calls about it. What's so interesting is uh, liver transplants. People that are on the liver transplant list cannot receive the liver if they have any positive drugs in yeah. their urine. And so I got involved with that group. And we don't have the research to answer the question, but there's enough uh, information that it may be, and it's gonna be really low levels. So 
if somebody is using two weeks ago, they're gonna be positive in the blood for six to eight hours. That's it, it's not gonna be two weeks. And by the way, the snowboarder from Canada who said he had the party and um, so I'm on the World Anti-Doping Agency Prohibited Drug List Committee for all the uh, athletes and what drugs they can use. And that the reason he got to keep his gold medal was not because anybody believed that study, it was because of the regulations in the snowboarder thing. But to this day, people will say, oh yeah, that guy was didn't smoke, he was at the party and it just came up positive. <laughs> Baloney. So, but this one, I, I do, well, so first of all, I disagree a little bit with my good friend. I think if the drug goes first to the organs that have the highest level of perfusion. So it goes to the brain, it goes to the heart, the liver, and of course to the fat too. But the fat gets less um, blood flow through it. Then it, it goes more to the fat. So when we did our study, we looked at, we, we looked at, um, urine concentrations in men and women that were chronic frequent users. And we discovered an amazing thing, that women have significantly longer time to excrete the drug than men do. I was really surprised. The men came in with higher concentrations. Um, the women and the men uh, had similar BMIs, body mass index. And the first thing you think is, well, sure, women do it because women have a higher percent body fat. It was not related to body fat or body mass index at all, which was a big surprise. So it has to have some sort of hormonal thing as well for women, and we showed this in multiple matrices, that women uh, eliminate the drug slower, which is critically important for treatment programs because men and women go into the treatment program and they sign a behavioral contract. And the treatment people are saying, we need to throw this woman out. She's relapsing, she's using. And we're saying, no, no, no. And we have models we've developed that you can look to see if anybody's used between any two urine samples. The problem is there's one model for occasional users and another model for chronic frequent users. So you have to really have some idea. Now, when they show up in treatment, they're more chronic frequent users. But I believe there is something to that story. Uh, but I, it's more, it ends up in the urine, okay? It's not blood. When these people who were, um, you know, having lost weight and all those things, it's urine that they were looking at. I don't think the blood levels will get to a detectable level. And I think it, it, you also have to look at the limit of quantitation in the studies. You know, if you're detecting, if you have a really low limit of quantitation, you can detect it out for 45 days. But the reality is, is that it's, those concentrations are not having a pharmacological effect. Well, that is a very, very important point. I think what is a pharmacological effect? There are two effects a pharmacologist always has to look at. The direct effect of activating a receptor and the much uh, slower and more si subtle effect of engaging a receptor, not directly activating it, but causing that receptor to desensitize, which means that the receptor now loses function. And those two don't have the same um, that don't occur at the same potencies right. and could very well be that low levels of THC that are not effective at a psychoactive level are still capable of engaging the receptor and causing some second messenger pathway. So now you're going, cause... to, you're going to prosecute those guys, whereas you can let the other guys go. Well, this, the good thing about this, uh, this session is that we don't have only to talk about prosecution, but we can also talk about science and hopefully at the end, everybody will come out with a richer idea. I know I already have, I've learned a tremendous deal. Um, maybe we could take a little bit of a pause here and see if there are any questions from the group. I see a question over there. For sure, there's a lot we don't know, and those are, <laughs> those are great points. Um, I had a question regarding the 11-hydroxy and what Good you would question. say regarding recency of use with hydroxy. Um, I know there have been studies published regarding uh, the detectability of hydroxy over the period of days, um, and more so in terms of I don't want to say shutting down the argument, but so many defense attorneys will bring up the point that yes, people can be positive for THC 30 days after use. Um, but I was wondering what your response was regarding recency of use, especially when you have a significant amount of hydroxy, not necessarily surpassing the Delta 9 THC, but um, a good amount of it um, present in terms of what your answer would be regarding window of time frame of use. 
Yeah, unfortunately, you can't tell anything. So we looked very much at that. The 11-hydroxy has a much shorter window of detection, but in the chronic frequent users, it's still extended like two days. Okay, so uh, you, you can't look at that. You would still agree it wouldn't be a week or 30 days ago if the hydroxy is present, it helps narrow down oh, yeah. that window of usage. The, the hydroxy is not there for a very long period of time, and we've documented all that. Yes. And also, besides yeah. our work, our colleagues in Australia uh, repeated, tried to repeat the, our study for seven days. Um, and there's some interesting data there, but uh, they, I know these people really well, and it's a good study, but it was done in an addiction treatment center. They had no, people coming in and out, and they didn't have a lot of security. And for one individual, I mean, most of it looks very relevant, but there's like one individual who, um, who dropped down to, you know, five and then was 12 and then 11 the next day. I, I, and they, they even write in there, they may have had access to drug. One of the things that I didn't bring up that I think everybody needs to know and important to law enforcement too, we were shocked. Normally, individuals in blood, it'll just decrease. Every day you expect it to decrease. We found in all but five people, they had a negative blood and then a positive blood. Really low, le you know, I mean, they're low levels. But that was shocking, and that has to do with the release from the fat. You know, did they move a piano? Did they, you know, they, they did something that released more, and, and that was in blood. The only five people that never had a negative blood result were all women. Um, Marilyn, though, can, can you maybe speak to your limit of quantitation? Because I, I, I do think that NIDA and a lot of the studies are reporting much lower yeah. um, uh, detection capabilities than most of the forensic laboratories. That's absolutely true. But our purpose is to go as low as we can. And then, you know, in all of our papers, then we say, okay, if you had used a one, if you had used a two, if you had used the five, what the results look like. But she's absolutely right. For all law enforcement purposes, they have a higher limit of quantification. One question that I heard raised multiple times is one of gender and sexual differences. We, in animal studies, we find a lot of differences between the two sexes. And in particular, we find females to be much more able to produce 11-hydroxy THC than male, male animals are. We don't look so much at clearance as you have alluded to, Marilyn, but we do look at metabolism. So hopefully we'll be able to see some of those data later on today. But uh, more generally, could we, could you comment, any of you comment on gender differences in human users? Um, what I do have is some demographics of our DUI arrested um, cases. 82% were male, 2% um, are 18 years or of, of age or younger, 10% were under the age of 21, and 40% are 25 years of age or younger. So the demographics of those that are being arrested are much, there's a much higher percentage of them to be male and uh, young males, um, basically over the age of 18 to, to age 25. Um, so I think that that's important to note as well, that we're, we're dealing with specific parts of the population in terms of cannabis and DUI. Any other comment on the sex difference, gender difference rather? because we're talking about humans. So I think you brought up a really important point. And if you look at the literature over the, the say, 50 years, almost all the studies were um, white men. And NIH recognized this, and it's certainly um, a problem because, you know, most, most people aren't white men. So, um, NIH has a policy for the last 10 years that you must include women in all your studies because it's very critical and other, other demographics as well because, you know, women, for instance, have different um, cardiovascular problems than men. We have different, you know, endocrine differences. So they're really pushing it. And it was very interesting in all of our studies where we actually gave drug 
I had to justify to the ethical committees why I didn't use people under the age of 17, why I didn't um, you know, include pregnant women, uh, and, and these things. So they're, they're taking it seriously. But we have a dearth of knowledge about women and other demographics. Maybe just a, a quick question over here. He's coming. He's coming. My exercise. Good job. Maybe another question or two. Uh, yes, Mrs. Harmon spoke about uh, the percentages for the arrests, and I was just wondering what the percentages were for alcohol and cannabis use combinations in those. Um, so question. what we see is um, in terms of uh, we have a, a, at this point about 29% prevalence of, of THC in our arrested DUI population. Um, 61% of our THC-positive drivers also have alcohol um, in their system. Um, in terms of total drug prevalence, um, our drivers, uh, we have nearly a 50% rate of at least one drug um, in, our DUI in our DUI cases, and we have a 62% prevalence of at least one drug in our fatally injured drivers. Um, our numbers in terms of cannabis THC versus cannabis use sit between 25 and 30 percent in our fatally injured drivers in the county. Um, so what we see more, more times than not, though, is the combination of drugs. We see quite a bit of polysubstance use. Um, and in our cases that have no alcohol in them, 40 percent have three or more drugs. In their system. Mm. Um, so there's definitely, in, in in my years of doing this, our prevalence of drugs in drivers has changed. We are seeing a steady increase in, in those numbers. And this year, in the last year, we've actually seen more drivers who are drug and alcohol um, positive or drug only positive more so than our alcohol positive cases. Um, so we are seeing definitely the combination of drugs. It's very common that we do that. It was a really an excellent question. Any any other question? I see one over there. Uh, so arguably, there are three um, species of cannabis, and within the species, there hun there's hundreds of different strains. And um, despite controlling CBD and THC levels um, across strains, um, they still yield different effects. And even within a specific strain, um, dependent on plant how it, the plant is grown, it still yields different effects. So how would you um, account for this discrepancy when using cannabis in flower form in studies? So you're, just so that we understand, your question is, what's the difference that we would see necessarily in the different strains in terms of impairment effects or in terms of biological testing? Is that the question? Um, I was asking how, would, how you would account for the discrepancy um, between using like different strains, which may yield different effects, or using, um, for example, like a specific, a specific strain, but um, it's grown differently, so it yields different effects as well. How would you account for these discrepancies when studying it in flower form? So I think what, what Jennifer was talking about, when, when you're measuring it in blood, you know, you, you're going to, the THC looks the same. Now, um, as far as the plant material, I know that dispensaries are doing a much better job now of not only looking at THC and CBD, but many of them are looking at 12 or 13 cannabinoids. They're looking at terpenes and flavonoids, and, and uh, they're looking for mold and heavy metals and the other things that can be present. But that we don't have a lot of research that is comparing the effects in different strains. We, we, when, when I, we have zero because we yeah, can't yeah. study it. Yeah. Ah, because you, well, you can if you go through an IND with the FDA and all that other. Well, we can only get pot from one place. Yeah, that's true. But they, that is absolutely true. And that's one of the, the big objections is researchers need access to different materials. And I don't know why it's still only Mahmoud al Soli. He is making a much greater variety now. But I, I believe the law passed, right? The DEA passed that other not police quite. have given no license. No, license. no unfortunately, not quite. What, what Dr. Eustace is referring to is the monopoly 
many of you know, some may not, the monopoly that the University of Mississippi has on cannabis for research. We all are obliged, uh, whenever we hold as we do, for example, a DEA Schedule One license, to get the material not from everywhere else where we could get it, but only from the farm in Mississippi. And there has been, uh, I think, a very uh, substantial amount of work done, credible work done, on uh, the validity, uh, the, uh, the external validity of the Mississippi cannabis, suggesting that it is not as valid as it should be. And of course, real world validity is very important to us researchers because we are spending taxpayer money. We would like to have our results to have an impact in the world, not being just something that produces a paper or two. So that, that, it, that was an interesting, intriguing question from the standpoint of law enforcement, impairment is impairment is impairment. So if you have enough THC in your blood, in THC in your brain, I would argue that then, of course, you, know, you, would, uh, uh, you would have greater amount of impairment. There is a question right here. Um, thank you very much for the scientific explanation of what's going on. And if I understand this, there is no one line someone can draw in the sand that tells you anything about the person, their background, their use, whether they're impaired or not. On the other hand, all of these people in blue have to go pull over people that are doing things they shouldn't be doing. And from uh, Ms. Harmon, a lot of these people are loaded up with a variety of chemicals. So after they've been to the blue guys and after they've been to the lab, how many of these people with these multiple across the line have their license suspended or actually removed from the road? Because that's the issue. If you've got people that are impaired, I don't care why they're impaired. I want them off the road. And you guys do have to work out being sensitive to the right threshold. Japan has a different sensitivity level for drinking, driving. But what's your conviction rate to get these guys off the road, which are mostly young males? That are... um, I can't speak to the conviction rate. I, I think we do have, they all leave. I, we do have a couple of prosecutors in the room. It does vary from county to county. Um, certainly our role in as forensic toxicologists isn't necessarily for someone to be convicted, it's to do solid science to provide information to the criminal justice system. Um, and if the case as, as a whole is, should go forward, it'll go forward. Um, it really does depend from county to county. There's, you know, there's a couple of different thresholds that have to be met legally. Uh, one, there has to be enough evidence for the case to go, tri go to trial, right? Um, they have to file the case, and then once it's filed, then it, and it, then it may or may not go to a jury trial. So. Um, I would defer to the table over here uh, with all of the specially trained prosecutors who may be able to answer that um, as in terms of how many people are actually convicted of these cases. Uh, what I can say in terms of cannabis, it is a lot less than it is for alcohol because um, juries do have, um, do believe that cannabis is, is safe. Um, and maybe safer to drive on. So it, it certainly does pose some challenges um, in explaining to the general public the, the public safety risks that cannabis can pose to driving. But I think they could probably speak better to the conviction rate over here at the table here. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot, folks, but... <laughs> right. Well, I, I think your question is more of a regulatory question as far as Department of Motor Vehicles and what they're going to do when someone is impaired because you asked how do you get these drivers off the road. My understanding currently is the Department of Motor Vehicles doesn't take any um, administrative action when it comes to drugs. So even though it would take administrative action when someone has a 0.08 blood alcohol concentration or higher and automatically suspend or revoke their license, when it comes to DUI drugs, they don't do that. So they're not taking the uh, administer, as far as an administrative role, they're not taking their licenses. Their criminal justice system is not involved in whether someone takes away their license or not. That's, admi that's purely administrative. So that's a little different from uh, how many people are actually getting convicted. Does that answer your question? Sort of. Well, your follow-up question would be, what's the conviction rate when it comes to drugs? And my answer would be, it depends. It really depends on, 
For example, for, for our county, Los Angeles County, it depends what part of the county you're in. And, and a lot of it has to do with what type of education they receive with regard to the consequences of drugs and impairment. So in certain parts of the county where we have maybe, a, a, well, in our part of the county, there's a, a huge concentration of dispensaries in particular areas of the county. And we find that in those areas of the county, there's higher tolerance for behavior involved with cannabis and other types of drugs. In other parts of the counties, which would be considered more conservative, there's less tolerance for it. So it really does depend on your jury pool's um, education and um, whether or not they would be inclined to um, see impairment in cannabis as something that uh, falls within the illegal aspect of the, the consumption. So it depends. Correct. But for drugs, no. No, and it doesn't matter if it's heroin, methamphetamine, cannabis, it doesn't matter. So that's something you might want to contact your legislature about. <laughs> and I, I'd like to add a non-scientific um, answer to that. Um, I'm not an attorney, but I get many, many calls from attorneys. And unless, you know, if there's a death involved, it's much more likely to go um, to court. But if it's not a death, they're very hesitant to take it uh, to trial. We have a couple of more minutes uh, before the closure of this event. I, I would like to take advantage of those minutes to uh, ask two questions, which I, I really believe are quite important. And uh, they pertain to the issue of what we do as we move forward. So what is it that we... Um, these panelists, as well as the audience, what, what we as a community, what do you think are important research agenda items that should be uh, uh, considered for the next couple of years in this area? So research, a research agenda for cannabis and driving, number one. And the second question, which is really strictly, very closely related to that, is education. It is what kind of... Uh, 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 education program do we all think should be in place to prevent the use of cannabis, particularly to prevent the use of cannabis in combination with other drugs and particularly with alcohol uh, uh, and use of cannabis and driving. So I'll start off with the research. What in your opinion, and also please feel free to pitch in, in everybody's opinion in this audience, are the main question marks that need to be answered in the next couple of years to the Two to, five, two to three years. I think from, from the forensic perspective, the real prevalence needs to be understood. Um, it, in terms of uh, public policy, a lot of uh, what is actually happening with the laboratories um, and even happening with law enforcement is that um, a lot of these samples are, are the actual drugs that are in there are underreported because the testing isn't taking place. So we don't really know what people who are being arrested for are actually on. We don't really know what our fatally injured drivers are actually on. We, we've pr proposed legislation um, to, to the state, both in the Senate and the Assembly. Our bill has moved forward to actually obligate through the government code and the vehicle code that all fatally injured drivers be comprehensively tested for drugs. Right now, the state only requires that they be tested for alcohol. So I think from, from our perspective in terms of forensics is we need to know what the real prevalence of what people are on. And if we can determine what people are on, then hopefully the adjudication process can help in getting people into treatment and the right kind of treatment that they need to be in. Um, and without having the resources to do that, much like having the resources to research many of these other issues, um, we struggle with having the what the information we need to make good public policy. Um, so I think from our perspective, we would just like to see that the, the labs have consistent testing across the state and that the right the prevalence data is really collected so we understand the scope of what the problem really is, not just for law enforcement, but from a pu public safety perspective. I'd like to probe you on this a little bit. Again, that's my prerogative. 
Don't you think that it would be important to transition, after having heard Dr. Fitzgerald and Dr. Hustis speak about this, transition toward an oral fluid testing model? And that would require, of course, a lot of validation. Do you think this is something that would make sense to you from your perspective? Um, I think oral fluid is something that is absolutely going to be happening in California. There are multiple projects that are taking place. Um, again, um, the sophistication of the laboratories is critical in order for oral fluid to be a matrix that we can actually test in. Um, Orange County is very unique in its capabilities. It's, it has the ability to, to, and the technology to do testing that most, if not all, the rest of the state cannot yet do. And so, and, and my colleagues here will, will tell you that um, the laboratories need resources in order to be able to effectively use oral fluid um, as, a, as a matrix to be tested. But I do think that um, it's coming and it's probably something that is going to be used. Thank you. Dr. Fitzgerald, what are your thoughts? Well, one of the things that I think that we severely need is ways to demonstrate that the labs get similar results because these are way more difficult analytes to measure than alcohol. And when we first started measuring alcohol 30 or 40 years ago, the accuracy wasn't there. Um, and that's probably the same case currently for some of these other, especially 11-hydroxy and some of the other minor metabolites. So if we had a proficiency testing program that was statewide or countrywide where we could all analyze the same sample and show we got the same result, that's going to at least get us so we can make better interpretations. That, that's actually a wonderful point. You know, one of the first, actually, I think the first slide that Dr. Houston showed compared alcohol to cannabis, and that's something that, that's a new slide for me. I haven't seen it before. And it says alcohol is one compound, and we have 500 compounds, 140 of which are cannabinoids. And uh, all of this could be, all those could be playing a role, and 11 hydroxy is a big mystery, at least to me, um, for a variety of reasons. Dr. Houston. So I want to address both of the things. So first of all, I want to absolutely emphasize, you know, this is ridiculous to say in fatal cases you only measure alcohol. It's terrible. So what happens is people don't see the other drugs and it doesn't get noticed and it doesn't get attention paid. The big wake-up call for us in the U.S. was NHTSA's roadside survey. So about every 10 years, NHTSA collects um, breathalyzer for alcohol, and they know the prevalence of alcohol, they know how it's going down, all that. Finally, in 2007, they took blood and oral fluid for the very first time, and it was shocking the amount of drug use that was present. If you took all the drugs together, there were more drug use than alcohol. But even so, to see, it was 8.5% of people stopped had THC in their blood or their oral fluid. So the Office of National Drug Control policy went, oh, my God, we are, I mean, and I'll tell you, we are so far behind other countries on the problem of drug driving, it's ridiculous. So the ONDCP said, we're not waiting 10 years, do it again. It took five years for them to get it going. And when the data came out in just, it's like six years by the time the paper came out. In just that time frame, there was a 48% increase in THC in the blood or oral. In six years, that's how all our changes in medical and legal cannabis. And we wait till we see if there's another one, what it's going to be. But I mean, at what point are we going to recognize this? You know what I'm afraid of? You know, we have wonderful work by Mothers Against Drunk Driving. I'm very impressed with young people who have a designated driver or whatever. I mean, the, the problem of alcohol, everybody knows about it. I mean, not everybody follows it. But to hear young kids talk about, well, okay, I'm the designated driver tonight. I mean, it's in their consciousness. We're going to wait until we have so many deaths by cannabis that finally the same thing's going to happen. And people are going to, you know, when you lose your brother, your child, whatever, it's going to become very real to you and we'll get people interested and eventually do that. And I'm going to make a very controversial statement. I think there's so much exposure of young children, fetuses, 
uh, young adolescents starting. I say in 20 or 30 years, the actual IQ in the U.S. is going to be lower because we're having a whole generation that's being exposed in multiple ways. And that has long-term consequences for our country, our ability to you know, compete in the world stage, much less on every single individual. So, I mean, it's something that people really need to pay attention to and get concerned with. And I don't care if you want to smoke cannabis. I don't care. I'm not a prude. I like my champagne, as Rob knows. But do it at home. Do it responsibly. Don't expose children. Don't go out and drive and put other people at risk. Obviously, education is a key, a key component here, a key factor. And that's one thing that I am personally very shocked by is the fact that there is so little. There are so few billboards out there that say, do not use and drive. Uh, yeah, use at home safely. Uh, specific indications to the amount of time that is needed between having used after, say, inhalation or having used after, say, oral ingestion and when it's actually safe to drive, uh, maybe, maybe the, uh, our law enforcement officers have better information than they do, but me as a citizen, I don't see a lot of that happening out there. I see a lot of billboards uh, coming by cannabis where I, right here, right? I saw that. I see that a lot. I don't see the type of education that I would like to see. And although I do not share Dr. Houston's uh, concerns about the IQ because we are already pretty <laughs> low, so I think going even lower than that would be problematic. But anyway, aside from the joke, uh, I don't share that particular concern about cannabis, but they do, uh, do think that taking, keeping, keeping cannabis away from, uh, uh, from adolescents as well as uh, pre uh, pregnant women or nursing mothers is something that is really common sense and we shouldn't be even talking about it, right? We should just give it for granted. But again, that's where education will really play an important role. Um, but Just wait, I want to add about the research part. That yeah, is, go ahead. Okay. So I think we need the research, good clinical research, showing that different cannabinoids, cannabigerol, cannabinol, T8, whatever it is, that they're effective. We need that desperately. Um, I think the education of the public. If you so, when I went to Australia as a visiting distinguished scientist, every city I gave educational lectures, and then every um, city, we gave public, open to the public, come hear about cannabis, whatever. It was overflowing, packed with people who wanted to know. There's a huge, huge need. So I think we need that. We need the basic research as well. We need to know what are these other channels, the TRPV channels that cannabis is working in. What, you know, there's so much basic data we need desperately to, to even lead us into which areas clinically might be important. Dr. Jung, your, your turn now. Well, I agree okay. with all of our colleagues here, but just to piggyback on their points is that I, I do believe that there needs to be appropriate funding for all the labs, expanding the testing of the range of different cannabinoids that are in there, because there are, like you said, up to like 104 different cannabinoids. And then there are also those synthetic cannabinoids that uh, people are using, and you know the introduction of legal legalization is going to you know, that the, the use of different types of drugs is going to be changing over time. So it's not going to be a static type of thing, and your your prevalence is going to change over time. And so uh, making sure that you have the funding for the labs, make sure that they're all standardized, um, validated. I think that there is a really good uh, another area of importance is to expand the biomarkers to to look at other objective markers that we can look at, uh, not just biometry, but also like uh, other things that may be able to be brought out in the field or even done in the station, like EEG, uh, maybe we can develop a portable MRI. <laughs> but, you know, I think that just continuing to, to look for other markers, and it could be in the blood too, it could be other biomarkers biomark in the blood that would tell us exactly when people are using it, and the, the active effect of cannabis on the brain. So uh, I think research needs to focus on this area. Yeah, to comment a little bit on that point, that's really, really important. Um, I, um, Dr. Eustace pointed out that we need clinical research and we also need experimental in the laboratory 
on animals and as well as humans. But we, well, one thing that we do not really have that is satisfactory is measure really understanding how the, um, uh, the when the receptor is activated, how much of it is activated, and what are the consequent consequent results. Uh, one thing that we do do, we have a VAS, a visual a analog scale, where we ask people how high do you feel, and they you know they give a response and answer from zero to ten, etc. And you're very very familiar with those. The problem is that subjective. Is there any way objectively, not, of course, of course not an, a PET scan, which is in terms of timing very static, is not something more dynamic that allows us to really uh, get a sense of uh, uh, how a, a, an individual responds to uh, activation of a cannabinoid receptor. That is an area where I think there, there could be uh, uh, useful research done. Um, we only have a few more minutes left, and there, is, there might be other questions, but there is certainly one over there. Yeah. Um, so we've, we frequently use um, one of your studies in the Orange County Crime Lab study of actual drivers and then DRE evaluations to support our opinions in court. Um, what likelihood do you guys see in the future where a set of SSTs or, you know, the SFSTs can actually be validated, maybe not to a level, obviously, but impairment or no impairment in, in the future. I think Rob can probably that that's exactly what they're doing. That's what I thought. <laughs> yeah, so that's what we, we hope to be able to show, um, and we'll know in a couple of weeks. Oh, okay. Sorry, I can't give you a better answer. <laughs> we're, we're, it's, yeah, it is very exciting. We've been working on it for three years, so it's and, and we did the study with the International Association of Chiefs of Police, where they had, you know, as Jennifer said, you know, it's polypharmacy. You, it's very rare to find only one drug. And uh, so they, the police collected 302 cannabis-only cases with full DRE exams. And we went through and found the parts of the exam that were most sensitive to cannabis. And I hope, I, I say it at every DRE meeting, I hope the DREs have that information and might, you know, look at, as they do the exam, at those specific areas where, where they were most susceptible to cannabis impairment. And, and I think it's safe to say, too, that the International Association of Chiefs of Police continue to evaluate their process on uh, multiple times a year to ensure that they have the most current information and the most current research. They have a, a national technical advisory panel with doctors, optometrists, law enforcement, toxicologists that continue to, to enhance and improve that curriculum. Um, and, and they're very well aware of a lot of this research and are, are actively involved in research studies like, um, like UPS that is, is trying to ensure that the tools that they're using are effective at roadside to address impairment. I have one question for Dr. Young. So um, one of the things that the DREs report seeing a lot um, is rebound dilation when the flashlight is uh, shined into the eyes. And you know, when DREs would come, because we had trained Tom Woodward from Maryland, trained all our graduate students and postdocs to do these exams, but we never put people in a dark room and, and put a light in their eye. That would be a really good thing for you to be able to look at. Yeah. So the you know the technology and at least measuring exact and precise pupil size is is very very precise, uh, and and it can measure the pupil size and and record it um, through you know, fractions of a millimeter. Um, it basically can take a a small clip of five to ten seconds, um, and we can measure that pupil dynamically as it's constricting, as it's dilating, and that is one of the measurements that we can look at uh, in the dark to look at whether or not rebound dilation really is something that uh, is seen in uh, subjects that are under the influence of cannabis. Hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get us some money. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think at this point we are at 157, I can see, so we, it's about time for us to close. I think our panelists, and I leave the floor to Professor Saul. Yeah, how about an enormous hand? What a great job. Yeah.